Hello folks and welcome to today's uh, episode of our game. Myself, James Davis, and joined as ever by Michael Verney. Very, very packed weekend. Uh, we're brought to you by orgoretro.com. Use the promo code our game and you'll get 15% off. Uh, there's a very pointed reason why we're wearing the jerseys that we're wearing today. Obviously the, the Kerry one here and the and the Offaly one there. And really terrible news last night that uh, Liam Kearns, who's the current Offaly manager and native, of course, of Kerry, has passed away age 61. A man that we would have come across many times over the years in our journalistic exploits and just a, a savage, horrible loss for both yeah, him, his family, yeah. his wife, Angela, who you and I spent a bit of time with last summer at the live event we had it on Pukon when he was a guest. Just uh, just terrible stuff. Yeah, very hard to get your head around the chain. Uh, Liam was a gentleman and he did as I had with him. And I'm sure, I'm sure you'd echo those sentiments. Uh, Big family man, big GA man. Um, yeah, very, just really, really sad. And one of those things that that really, like, really hits you hard because, like, by all accounts, I believe he'd, he'd been with the Offaly lads yesterday morning and, and was in grey form. So, uh, yeah, really, really sad news. Obviously, such a like he's such a like a long managerial, uh, you know, career at inter county level. Had those great days with Limerick, um, was with Leash as well. Had great days with like Tipperary's, some of Tipperary's best days outside of that Munster final recently. And even with Offaly now, when he took on an Offaly job that probably wasn't the most appetising in the world with, you know, Niall McNamee stepping away and a lot of other lads unavailable. But they were already well assured of our Division 3 status now at this stage. And yeah, it's just, yeah, it's very, very, yeah, very, very hard to get your head around. Taken, taken far too soon at 61. Yeah, like we we spent a nice bit of time with him uh, in that event. I think it was August or, or July, maybe last summer in Ampukon and Galway, and just great company, easy company. Great humor either. to him, hadn't he? Like he'd really good humor, to a really good sense of humor as well, hadn't he? And good stories to him as well. And like you and I spent time with him in a, on Pukon after the event, and then he was staying in the same hotel that I was staying in. And afterwards, you know, I, I with his wife Angela, we just had a couple of more drinks and just the crack and. Ah, it's just so terrible to think, you know, I mean, just just the whole evening when you look back at it now and to think, you know, that, that he's passed away, it's just, uh, oh, it's it's hard to get your head around. Yeah, no, it definitely is. And like, I don't know, I, this is probably an unprecedented scenario in the sense of like the Offaly squad, like, I don't know what sort, what sort of headspace those guys are going to be in as well. And I don't think anything like this has ever happened um, before. Really, um, and they're going to be playing at the weekend as well. So, yeah, first and foremost, though, like just deepest condolences from yourself and yourself to to the family, and particularly to to his uh, his loving wife. Yeah, and I like several. Like he's a fun character as well. Like I know the Tipperary lads absolutely loved him and had some great nights. And of course, there's that famous video of him singing in the dressing room. And another thing as well was back in 2014. Um, he had a selector who is the same, uh, full, the exact same name as me, who is now currently a selector with the, the Tipperary Under-20 hurlers. And, uh, you know, now and again, people will mix us up or whatever. So recently I was asked, how am I getting on managing Black Rock hurlers in Cork? And of course I'm not. <laughs> but, uh, you know, and, and um, I, I think at the time, uh, Shane was part of the management team that Liam had at Tipperary. This was in 2014. So obviously management team, teams do their video analysis and all that, and sure. Uh, Liam ended up somehow having my email address and emailing me the stats and the video analysis of their next game against Galway and the clips and the things they were focusing on. And I emailed him back and said, look, I, I do appreciate the clips and stuff like that. It'll help me with my preview. But, um, you know, you probably don't want to be sending this to a journalist. And sure, I know he didn't cop it or he didn't pay much attention. And sure, he did it for the next game as well. And then I messed him again. And finally <laughs> but, uh, yeah, just just such a, a fierce, nice character and um, devastating loss. And just the comments coming in. Uh, Cassius King says, devastating news. May rest in peace. Grodo go crack on. RIP Liam Kearns. Unbelievable manager. Brought tip from nothing to All-Ireland semi-final. And Adrian Kelly, fierce sad news. Did great work with Limerick footballers and always came across as a real gent. Yeah, just a, a really personable fella. 
so RIP indeed. Um, just as well on Liam, like a big stacks man as well. That's where I think he won all Ireland minor. Um, he won a couple of trench cups, I think, with the Garda College when he was involved with them as well. Um, he's and he's like it only just retired as well, which makes it you know. You know, even sadder, I suppose, as well. But yeah, deepest, deepest condolences to, to all the current family from from all of us. Yeah, it seems a bit trite to go and talk about uh, GA matters after that, but I suppose that that is the show. And you know, again, you know, we couldn't but pay tribute to him. Uh, the first managerial uh, departure in terms of a, of a manager actually stepping away is uh, Ray Dempsey. Just five games with Limerick. Obviously, it hasn't been going their way so far. But um, the players held a meeting. Apparently, there was issues around man management and preparation. I suppose this is on the back of Billy Lee, who had done such a great job there, and they were, of course, in the Munster final last year and so on. But um, they're basically going to be condemned to relegation if they don't beat fellow strugglers Kildare next week. Um, and I suppose they had a good side of the draw. Like they're waiting to, in terms of Munster, they're waiting for the winners of Cork or Clare. So they've, they're on the far, the opposite side to, to Kerry. So it probably just feels like from the inside, they're just thinking, we've no time to waste, we need to make a move now. But it is ruthless. Uh, very much, very ruthless. Um, it was always going to be difficult in Division Two, I suppose. Potentially, maybe they're looking at you know how loud have thrived in Division Two and how maybe Limerick have gone the other way. Uh, and both teams, there was only a score probably between them when they played last year and even when they played in that Division Three final. Um, I, listen, I don't know the ins and outs of it exactly, but it sounds like there was a big difference between Billy Lee's style. And Ray Dempsey's style, and that that may have put some noses out of joint. And I can, I, I, I'm only speaking hypothetically here, but I can under, I can understand when you're used to one thing and you've only come come up with, you know, a certain style of management. That if something is completely different, that yeah, it can be a bit of a, a culture shock or whatever. That's not to say. But well, here's a like you're looking at a guy in Ray Dempsey who obviously uh, got knocked more over the line twice at the row in Mayo was like, you know, it was really like, it was probably 60-40 in Max Day's favour for who was going to be Mayo manager. Ray Dempsey could easily be the Mayo manager now as well. So um, it's probably the first kind of, uh, it's probably the first big kind of player-led kind of thing that we've heard in a while. It hasn't, it's kind of gone quiet on the inter-county front, maybe since around Anthony Cunningham's time in Galway and maybe... Um, Kennelly, Kennelly and Holmes in Mayo. We haven't really heard any of this type of thing coming out, but it's um yeah, it's it's ruthless. I'd I'd like to hear the other side of the story, and I'm sure we will in time. Yeah, and like you said, he's had success with Knockmore and underage teams with Mayo as well. So you know that this may well not be the end for Ray Dempsey. He might be back on the scene again. Uh, there's been a racism incident in an intercounty challenge match. So that was a minor uh, challenge match between Offaly and Watford. The game was abandoned. Um, like it was in the second half, apparently player abused and um, Watford walked off the pitch in protest. So obviously pretty uh, pretty nasty stuff there and you'd hope that uh, that sort of thing doesn't continue and that whoever did it is, is punished accordingly. Uh, London Camogie Club, they're launching a campaign to replace Scorts. Anytime um, I talk to Camogie players, they really do not seem to like wearing the Scorts and they, I, from what I gather as well, they tend to just wear normal shorts in training. So it seems like quite an impediment to then go and have to wear that in a match. You know, it's probably, and I mean, I, I just wonder why it's taken so long because it's, you know, I mean, it's been within the remit of the Camogie Association all along. And you'd imagine that it's it's women who are leading it up and, you know, in terms of like the admin side, who's going to help push this through or not? Like, I can't imagine that too many men are going to put their opinion into this. So there's obviously some traditionalists there who want to retain the scorts, but if the players don't want it, it's time to move on from it. Yeah, it's just one of these things where um, everybody knows it should change, but it seems to be within the GA, it takes a long time for these things to actually happen. Like, it's only, it's not that long ago, like 90s, where you they were wearing, you know, like big long skirts that had to have impeded like how you played, like. Um, and yeah, I've been involved with, you know, the odd Camogie team here and there, and they would all be wearing shorts and training so it's Tom, the Thomas McCartan's club in London um, they've kind of started the ball rolling um, what was the quote they used uh, it said the long and scart of it 
Uh, that was the the way the, the way they said it. But I think they'd done some research, and I think it was like eighty two percent wanted to get rid of the scort. And we'll obviously have Ursula Jacob on the show later on as well, and I'm sure she'll give her two cents on it. But I haven't exactly ever heard anybody defending the scort and saying, "Yeah, we we should definitely keep this." So I'd imagine that's something that will change over the coming years, definitely. Yeah, maybe we could do a video in terms of like finding out how comfortable or otherwise they are. You might be the uh, guinea pig. <laughs> I thought there might be something coming down, down the tracks that wouldn't be particularly appetising. I don't see myself doing that shit, not for all the tea in China. Yeah, I struggle to keep a straight face as the idea came to mind. I'm like, will I be able to get through this sentence? And I just about it, that. It, it regularly happens on this show that you're saying something and I just, I'm kind of smirking him after thinking of something and you're just like, what are you smirking at there? So I say that was the exact same in this scenario. Um, we'll we'll talk about the Kilkenny and Dublin game later, but uh, Michal Donoghue has paid tribute to Eamon Trollier Dillon, who's retired due to injury. This is a persistent knee issue. Geez, he had some great days with Dublin over the years. Even think of that game where, wasn't it, Dublin were 16 points behind on Kenny and they made a huge comeback in the second half. And he, I'm pretty sure he came on at halftime. It was a huge yeah. part of that turnaround. Yeah, so he's had some great days and no doubt he'll have some more with Nate Fionvara in Dublin, assuming that his knee is okay. Trolley or um, from, there used to be a programme on TV back in the day, Eamon's Trolley Bus. And that's apparently where uh, Trolley or came from. Uh, I tell you, I put it to you this way, he, he would have been coming in late in a lot of games and he's not the sort of lad you would have liked seeing coming in on you, and particularly if he was flying. And he seemed to be very, very good coming in off the bench. Um, I remember that day against Kilkenny well. He had definitely helped turn the game. He probably, I think he started against Cork the next day out, maybe not as good, but he was a real good player to come in and make a massive impact. And he's been around like he's been around a long time now at this stage as well. Sad that it, his career has to end in, in that way and not you know on the pitch as you always want to finish your career. Yeah, and as we'll touch on later as well, like don't know who could have done with him as an option because they're short of so many many at the moment. Um, Claire, like this was a real trend over the weekend that teams started quite well and ended up falling away and losing their matches. So just to look at Claire, for example, I think they went, yeah, it was eight points to one ahead against Galway and ultimately lost 22 points to 124. And this was, of course, at home. And like, l- let's look at the trend across the board. Watford went four points to one ahead and we're playing the better stuff. Took Tipperary a while to get going. Same in the second half. Um, I think also there was the Cork game against Watford or Wexford, Wexford were well ahead and then Cork came out and uh, won the game as well. So it's a bit of a strange one. It's like 2018 when uh, the eight or nine point lead ended up being a dangerous lead. Yeah, I remember that actually. Yeah, those two mad all Ireland semi finals as well. And even, as you said, Kilkenny were 16 up on Dublin and nearly lost that game. And Kilkenny were at least nine up on Watford in that 2020 all Ireland semi final and ended up getting beat, beaten comprehensively enough after. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny, like if you went eight one up in football, like the chances of you losing that game are you you'd have to say really slim. Not that you'd shut up shop or anything like that. But in Hurling, like Galway were well back in that game ten minutes after being seven points down. And you'd have to say, um, they were much the better team for three quarters of the game, having started, you know, really poorly. But they let they let Claire do as they liked in that opening quarter. Um uh, Claire had so much time in the ball. John Conlon was walking out with ball. Conor Cleary was walking out with ball on a pose at times. They had time to look up to see where they were going in. And it's funny, Shane, you mentioned about that 8-1 as well. Claire had a couple of chances that could, they could have ended up, you know, 11, 12 one up. They were really wasteful for four or five yeah. minutes after that spell. And I always think, you know, in snooker, you know, in snooker they say the ball, the balls never forget or they never forget, they never forgive you or whatever. They come back and haunt you if you're after missing a couple of shots that you should have. It can be the same in hurling that when you have the chance to really, you know, keep the foot on a team's throat or whatever. If you don't take those chances, the other team almost gets a bit of momentum. I think Evan Nyland hit three in a row, definitely two from play in a row and a free as well. All of a sudden, Galway were back in the game. And, uh, yeah, Clare never really looked like winning the game. He, and he said in the second half, you'd have to say. Yeah, it was quite strange. Grodo Gracon says maybe it's to do with training blocks. And that is something that has occurred to me as well, that teams start well, and actually maybe that's a symptom of the fact that they're physically flying at the moment, but then they run out of juice. you feel like that could be... I don't know, really. I, I would have said, to be honest with you, that if you started well... Um, like a lot of time would be a lack of freshness, maybe that you wouldn't hit the ground running from the start, if you if you get me, and you feel like you're a bit stuck to the ground. Maybe that was the case with Galway, but 
I I don't know. I kind of find it hard to make excuses. You'll hear anecdotally different things or teams are at different stages or whatever. Everybody's training hard at the moment. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Every, so I just I, I don't really kind of see it as an excuse. Yeah, so Clare were eight points to one up after 14 minutes. They lost the rest of the game by, was it so, it was 14 points to 123. So that's 12 points for the rest of the game that they were beaten. Did you notice uh, uh, how it was a bit of a, a game of ping pong at times? So a team would have a shot, then puck out, bang, over the bar or bang wide. So like the amount of times that David Fitzgerald was able to just get on ball yeah. from a puck out instantly. And another thing I noticed that, and look, this may have changed during the summer or what have you, but... There's a lot of times when Galway... So, Clare seem to be pushing two men up front either side of the D when they're defending a puck out for Galway. So, therefore, the idea is that they're keeping the numbers further back the field and they don't really mind if Galway get it short. The other way around, Galway had three up front, and which is which is fine in another way. Like, obviously, teams have different plans, but there was a lot of times when Clare were able to get the ball unopposed in their half-back line because Galway had pushed three men up front and they didn't have numbers back. And I just wonder, they like... We're not too fussed about tactics in these games and just what will be will be. But um, it definitely was a feature and maybe added to the fact that it was a ping-pong match. Yeah, I definitely actually remember particularly stages. Well, the first half and even the second half as well, where David Fitzgerald just got free shots away and Tony Kelly getting a few free shots away. Even though he didn't score, Shane, at all. Not from play or not from a play ball. And I was only saying to you off air, like, when's the last time this happened? He obviously did score in the All-Ireland semi-final last year. I think he hit a couple of frees, even though he was kept very quiet by Mikey Butler. I couldn't think of, and I'd love to hear Adrian McGrath, Derek Lynch, or any of the Clare boys be able to tell us when was the last time he didn't score from play. He was playing an unusual, kind of really kind of a deep role, was picking the ball up around his own 45 at different stages. And I know we're, um, I know we're probably going to, not going to talk about it directly now, but Desi Hutchinson played a really similar role with Water too, which I found really strange out around the middle of the park. And I just, I don't know, it's not usually where you have your killers really out around the middle of the park. So I did find, I find that kind of strange in both respects. Yeah, I, I suppose with Tony Kelly, like if I go back to that Club All Ireland in 2017, a lot of the analysis we would have done beforehand was how he was picking up an awful lot of ball between his own 65 and 45. So that's in his game. So I can understand how you'd. You just want him to go wherever the ball is. But yeah, it was just a very muted performance from him. And yeah, get your comments in. When is the last time that Tony Kelly didn't score from play for Clare? Because you even go back to, was it 2011 was his debut for Clare against Dublin? He scored a 21-yard free that day. It was the day that, wasn't it, Dalo brought, oh no, it was 2012, that Dalo brought uh, Dublin down to Clare in Ennis. That's and, right. Uh, yeah, uh, that was that was a fair old occasion at that stage. I remember he scored a 21-yard free. He must have scored from play that day, but... Geez, it's very difficult to to think of any game at all where he wouldn't have scored. No, I kind of racked my brain trying to. Did he score against that. Tip last year? Because I know Seamus Kennedy kept him very quiet. Uh, sure, he would have been hitting freeze. He would have been hitting freeze. You know what I mean? I'm th- like just thinking, like to not score from play is one thing, but it, he would have been hitting freeze at various stages as well. Um, I'm sure there. I'm sure there probably is a time, but I just can't kind of think of it offhand at the moment. Um, just on on Galway as well, Shane. I thought it was really peculiar. I was looking back. The image you did for the preview of the game was John Conlon, Mark and Dahi Burke in 2018. And both of them were playing number six yesterday. Which I just was uh, like, a guy who's you know played 14 most of his career or 10 in Conlon. Dahi Burke has played, he obviously came in at wing back, played a bit of cornerback, but is, is one of the best fullbacks of the generation. Now you have the two of them at six. And... Both, like, obviously, both pretty polished yesterday. Dottie Burke came forward and got two great points. I'm wondering if Henry was looking at the Cork game and thinking, like, the way the Galway defence opened up, like, the Red Sea in that game, or they thinking, if he's there, that won't happen. And then they put McInerney at fullback. And a little hat tip to TJ Brennan as well. I thought he was very good when he went over on David Reedy because Reedy was causing uh, Jack Grealish a good bit of trouble. But he went over and got in really tight with him in his face and David Reedy got on a bit of ball after but he was way quieter once TJ Brennan went on him and if you look at the half back lane that Galway had you had obviously Mannion on one side Dahi Burke and uh, Joseph Cooney that's a fairly formidable half back line and a half back line that's going to be hard to break down whether they can afford to play the three of them there come big championship games I'm not so sure and they might need to move a couple of pieces around a bit yeah, would you be inclined to leave um, 
Dahi Burke out in the half back line. I mean, look, it's huge to have somebody of his quality mind in the square. But, uh, you know, I'd rather have a stopper rather than someone like him who's so dynamic, can drive forward, you know, as well with his Gaelic football background with Cara Finn. He knows how to give and go, which is all the, you know, the hallmarks of the modern game. Or do you be just thinking you just need a, a monster on the square? It's a difficult one, isn't it? Um, like, is he going to come to come a big championship game against, you know, your Limericks or Kilkenny's or whatever? Is he going to be pulled out? Is he going to be less influential? Whereas, you know, inside, you know, he's going to be picking up Aaron Galan or, you know, he's going to be picking up Owen Cody or, you know, a real marquee forward. And you're thinking... You know, if this is kamikaze stuff and there's real good ball going into the forwards, this guy is still going to break even at worst. Um, difficult when, you know, you're putting a 30-year-old in centre-back who's only played a handful of inter-county games at centre-back. Do you know what I mean? You're kind of... he's on, This is like Yesterday was his first game back this year. So how much time... Are, I think Shane O'Neill tried him there as well in a couple... I remember in a couple of league games. I... Reckon when push comes to shove, he'll probably end up back number three because I just yeah. think they might they won't be able to afford to not have not have him there. What's rare is wonderful too that he actually did an interview on telly afterwards. I remember he did it after one of the the Cara Finn All Irelands, and I remember all the players went behind the kind of glass shield yeah, yeah, and yeah. were ribbing away, and there he was doing the interview yesterday. Because a lot of uh, people wouldn't know what he sounds like because he's just he's never. Uh, I don't ever recall him. I don't. They're the only two interviews I ever recall him doing. I don't ever recall him doing any press things or all Ireland, you know, all Ireland uh, press nights for Galway or Corrafin or anything like that. But uh, yeah, I'm sure Shefflin is delighted to have him back. And he didn't look like he missed the beat. And I think he was pulled off probably at the right time too for a guy that has, you know, played very little action this year. Yeah, they still have Finton Burke to come in there too, which is uh, obviously true. Yeah, ML89 says, Claire haven't knocked out a top team in championship in 10 years. I don't see that changing either. They're just lacking something. Don't know, is it belief or something? So that's uh, ML89 discounting Wexford as a top team last year. Richard Hogan says, Galway have four massive defenders in Dahi Burke, Road Mac and Ernie Finton Burke and TJ Brennan. This could free up Joseph Cooney to the half forward line. Or maybe he's just another addition around that middle area because like physically he's huge. He can score from distance. He can deliver the ball and he's able to drive through the line. Um, Adrian McGrath, the clear man is in. The eight points to one wasn't dominance. It was accuracy in my view. Conlon dominated Whelan. Cleary and Flanagan were excellent. Kelly looked like a man there for a run out, which is as it should be. <laughs> right, okay. So everything was done to perfection by the sound. Ever, of ever, it, ever the man to put a positive spin on it, in fairness, Adrian. I'll give you Claire, that. He's worse than me saying tip her back. <laughs> Did Would you, you see... Did you see, you didn't see it because you were down at the game. Nisha's last question to Jason Ford on the pitch the other night was, I tip back. <laughs> and I was like, I can't believe this is a thing. Because I was chatting somebody the other day and they said to me as well, I tip back. I was like, it's like you've, made, you've made it a thing now. Well, I'd say Nisha did that probably just for me. Because oh, I'm yeah. in, uh, yeah, cause I'm just looking at the WhatsApp group I have with him and some of the other uh Bogger apes from Kula, and there's a comment that went up on our WhatsApp group saying, "Our tip back with laughy faces around the time of the game being over." So obviously he had uh, one of the other lads had caught this and knew that it was directed at me. But uh, yeah, that's a good one. Um, John Conlon's, I suppose, redeployment at centre back. Have we ever seen a player have his position switched um, so in such an unlikely circumstances because he was a full forward, but so successfully? Probably not, and I'd say both of us were probably questioning whether it was going to work after the... Wasn't he centre-back when Antrim beat them up in Corrigan Park that time? And, you know, the, oh, the question we wrote him off, didn't we? Oh, no, we did, yeah, and the question was, you know, you know, is Brian Lowen a bit mad for putting him back here? And, oh, he'd be back full forward the next day, or he'd be back wing forward, or whatever it is. But he stuck it out. Um, he's so cool on the ball, and, like, he did... A, when, when Whelan was out centre-forward yesterday, he was brilliant on him and spoiled him beautifully. And Conor Whelan, outside of that goal, kind of cut a really str frustrated figure yesterday. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, Conor was has been outstanding at centre-back. And listen, the all Ireland semi-final last year against Kilkenny would probably be a completely different proposition had he been on the pitch. And there's no point in saying any different about it. It probably would have been. Yeah, OK. So, uh, just go through a couple of more of the comments here. Uh, this is in terms of Clare again. Their historic victories the last decade have mostly been Leash and Wexford. Struggling to think of an actual All-Ireland contender they've beaten in a knockout game since 2013. Strange one. And then, of course, in 2013, did they beat the best teams in Ireland, Michael Verney? Um, we've probably... Ah, listen, I think even Clare people are kind of 
realizing that it's you know it's it's tip 2019 or Clare 2013 for the softest all Ireland's won in recent times. No point in saying any different. Oh, yeah, good man, turned the gun on me. <laughs> Dimitri says Dahi Burke holding the mic looked like all he was missing was the I shot JR t shirt from the unbelievable. <laughs> that was from Father Ted, wasn't it? Father Ted, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I think, um, I think, I think your man in the unbelievable might have had something similar as well, yeah. Yeah, TV Street Ford's uh, face when he asked him were tipped back. Smiley like, how did he face. answer that question? Like, J- Jason actually answered it quite well, and he was there was kind of a smirk about it because, like, you know, that's like something you get someone says to you down the pub or something, and you're having a bit of a laugh or something, and instead, Nisha says it to him live on national television. <laughs> uh, so, Pat OK says, tip are so back. Interesting spelling of back. Uh, have changed our tune on Monster Lads. Cork and Watford not qualifying, in my opinion. Like, we'd probably change our opinion on this every week, but one thing's for sure, tip our back. Yeah, I I think we'll have to do, you know, before the round robin, and we have, we're armed with a load of information, we'll do you know, a confident call on one, two, three, four, five and one, two, three, four, five, six in Leinster. Um but I yeah, my opinion is changing the whole time. Based on what I've seen from Watford so far, I, and I would have had Watford as probably second in Munster. I don't see them getting out at the moment with all these injuries. That probably heaps into that as well. But we'll we'll uh, we might keep our powder dry on that one. We will indeed. Okay, so Westmead had a one fifteen to one twenty seven defeat at home against Limerick. Our, uh, some of the big things from this, I suppose, Aaron Galan, he came on in the 63rd minute, got himself a point. Uh, they were, Limerick were 1-100 to 100 beforehand. Uh, Dermot Burns, he was back, first time that we've seen him. I think he was away up until a couple of weeks ago. Um, Groad Hegarty, he was replaced before throw-in by Tom Morrissey. Mike Casey, he came back, his first appearance of the season. And Kylie said out, John Kylie said afterwards, Mike and Dermot and Aaron are all very important members of our group. It's really important that we get the requisite amount of game time into them now because the next six or seven weeks is a really important phase. Westmead gave Limerick a guard of honour before the game. So it's the fourth game into the league. I see no need for a guard of honour at this stage. Uh, ah, sure, listen, um, I, I, I don't know. It's usually the first game of the league or the first game of the season that you would do a guard of honour for the, the reigning All-Ireland champions and then, you know, you'd absolutely let her, let her into them straight away. Um, I don't know. I don't know what this was about. Maybe just, I don't know. I'd say it was maybe trying to make an occasion in Westmead and trying to maybe get more kids to come and create a better atmosphere there on the day or something like that maybe I'm, I'm not I'm not so sure really but it, it does kind of spark of you know if you're you know clapping a team coming out before a game are you admitting defeat before the match is even before a ball has even been thrown in maybe I'm being too cynical there it's a bit like all the Offaly pundits for years licking Kilkenny's arse in the media because you know you were getting hammered by him so it was all you had left to do <laughs> was lick their arses. in fairness to you I turned one back on you. You did a good job of turning it back on me. Um, listen, when push comes to shove, there was this was always going to be a fair defeat for Westmead, regardless. Um, I think the, the bigger talking points is the fact that Aaron Galan is back in the Limerick squad now. And any talk of you know them having to find a new focal point at the edge of the square or whatever seems to be redundant now. Uh, whether he'd start maybe the first round of Munster or even the second round is probably debatable uh, because by all accounts he hasn't been in the squad. I'm not even sure if he was on that training camp in Portugal, but I'd say there's a lot of people in Limerick kind of breathing a, a sigh of relief to have him back because he's he is probably their most important player based on based on how they play and what he's able to offer to them at the edge of the square. Yeah, so some of the like very changed team. Um, Ronan Connolly got game time. Colin Coughlin. Uh, Barry Murphy was out around the middle of the field. Cahill O'Neill, he was back. I think he got himself a couple of points. He got two, yeah. Uh, Donico Dalig, he scored five. Uh, Mike Casey, obviously, as we said, he came in. So very much a changed team, but putting up 127. It's interesting as well. We were looking at some of the different games, and you'd think if, if, you're, if you're a team like Limerick and you're going to win by 12 points, that you'd get more than one goal in a game. But even that galway Clare game, there was only two goal chances in the entire game. Connor Whelan, he forced the goal chance and he scored brilliantly. And then David Reedy had a brilliant chance. And I'm not entirely convinced it didn't clip off the defender's leg as the defender was falling and then hit the post. Yeah, I didn't even like I didn't I didn't notice that now, but that would have maybe changed the game potentially for Clare. From a Limerick point of view, one thing I've noticed um down through the recent years, you know, if they wanted to, they could put up like a crazy score 
against, we'll say, Offaly last year, against Westmead a couple of years ago, and probably against Westmead yesterday. But that doesn't really seem to be the modus operandi. If you're talking about heavy training loads, I'd say of all the teams, they would probably have had a, the heaviest of training loads coming into this weekend. And I'm sure that was quite pointed as well, because they know that they knew to be able to get in a good block of training in Portugal or wherever they were, probably trained two or three times a day. But they've never felt the need or it never looked like they felt the need to really turn the screw on opposition that they're clearly superior to, if you get me. They don't feel the need to hit seven goals and win by 40 points, even though they could if they wanted to. Yeah, Grodo Grakon has taken issue with people saying that Clare haven't beaten big teams in knockout championship games. So what were Galway in 2013, only the previous year's Leinster champions and the All-Ireland finalists who brought Kilkenny to a replay? Adrian McGrath's coming out swinging. There you are talking about Antrim beating Clare in the league, getting the next breath trying to read a huge amount into these results. Lohan has more options this season than he's had last year. To be fair, they do have great options. Like, look at the, the potential scorers in that team. David Reedy, Ian Galvin comes off the bench, he injects something. Tony Kelly, Peter Duggan's back for a year or two since going to Australia. Uh, David Fitz, Ian McCarthy, David Fitzgerald, Mark Rogers, Shane Meehan, Robin Mouncey comes on and has a few shots. So they do have great options, to be fair. Uh, Ian Donovan, tipper back by God. We haven't the best finishers. We have the best finishers in the game, no question. Would you debate that? The best finishers, um, a couple of them anyway. I think Jason, Jason Ford come on, scored five points. Haven't been. Uh, can I just say as well, Ty De Burka hit him with one of the most beautifully timed shots the other night. Ford was only on the field about a minute. And I'm thinking, Jesus, if, if Ford's out for this tonight, he could, you know, it could be, you know what I mean? You know, when you come in and you get a, a dunt like that, all of a sudden he puts over five, nearly five in a row. And I think as well, um, I can't remember if we mentioned him around the top five risk conversation, but some of the scores he got the other night were just like bang, bang. Like no, no movement hardly required, no shoulder action, just bang from distance. He was brilliant when he came on the other night. Yeah, I, I, I come to, yeah, sure. Look, we're going to talk about Tip Watford now, 423 to 25 points. And before the match, I was sitting beside Tomas McCarthy of WLRFM and the Watford News and Sport, and you know, having a bit of crack, doing a bit of jaw. And, and this is all in light of the fact that Watford, Tipperary haven't beaten Watford since was it the 2020 league, and you know, very much uh, at second or have been second best against Watford in recent times. And I was just, we were looking at the fact that there was a big crowd, and I was like, you know, you know, obviously tip her back, and it just feels like a bit of a homecoming here. We're, all we're missing is the lean McCarthy there, but otherwise it feels like a bit of a homecoming. And then I'd lean over to him and I'd say, uh, geez, do you know what? I'd, I'd actually pay just to ta watch Tip in the warm-up, wouldn't you? <laughs> so I was just winding him up from the get-go, but he knew I was having the crack, so we, we had good old fun with that. But um, yeah, what, what was your first thoughts on that performance on both sides? Um... Well, Waterford was a bit kind of Jekyll and Hyde at different times. Um, I was mystified. I said to you, I'm mystified as to why Desi Hutchinson is playing out the field. Um, and it, like, and not been smart. If you're going to play him out the field during the league, you'd imagine that's where he's going to be come championship time, which seems a bit bonkers considering he's one of the most dangerous inside forwards. Like, you can't tell me, and I know, um, Jack Prendergast was dangerous inside when he was in there at other times, and even Colin Dunford was in there a bit as well. You can't tell me that either of those two or anybody else that Watford have uh, is more dangerous inside than Desi Hutchinson so I, I find that I find that very strange uh, the Baron red card obviously had a big uh, a big playing on the game um, Tipperary got a goal I think within seconds after we don't yeah. exactly know, know what he did but it seemed like seemed like Davy was was okay with the sending off after because I know he'd have, he'd have caught Fergal Horgan uh, a couple of weeks ago over some decision that he made in their previous game. So if he said he was okay with it, he obviously saw it or whatever. But do you know what? I loved the needle in this game the other night. There was needle from start to finish. Um, Ford came in, remember, it was just lads running into him. There was needle from start to finish. There was needle going down the tunnel at half time. Um, and you can say that the you know not to read too much into a league game or the league is meaningless, but like I just that stuff is manna from heaven for me. Like just to see to see lads getting up close and personal with each other, and you know that's going to carry on to uh, come summer as well. Even to see Davy wagging the finger at cattle and cattle kind of smile back, and then I thought maybe the smile turned to you know to a bit of crack to you know. With, we will and we'll see in a few weeks or whatever. I just everything about this game, uh, maybe outside of the result, I, I loved it. 
Yeah, the result was top, top. No, I agree with you there. I know. Look, there was great needle. Uh, there's nothing more ludicrous than watching two players like rotting stags shoulder each other. It's brilliant. <laughs> it's great fun. I always remember one when David McInerney came on against Watford. Oh, this would be about five or six years ago. Himself and Ozzy Gleeson started shouldering each other. And I counted it back because it went on for so long. They did nine big shoulders on each other. It was absolutely ridiculous. Just getting down, shoulders warmed up. Just getting the yeah. shoulders warmed up. I have uh, PWL74 saying, uh, Shane, you forgot to put up a video of Breen's kick. Lucky boy. Now, I didn't, I was at the match. I didn't see it. Full Arsene Wenger. But if someone wants, and someone said it to me on Twitter last night, if you want to send a video, go ahead. I didn't see it, but if he didn't kicked it, it a, a didn't lot. didn't see it either now, to be honest with you. And I'd only be loving to highlight any tip indiscretions. And I, did, I didn't notice it now, I have to say. Yeah. Do you know what? I want to bring up on screen. So there's a lot of talk about the, the tactics that Watford employed in this game. And I'll give you my take on it. So I'm going to bring up a pitch map. And just for convenience sake, I'm going to bring up a pitch map uh, that we had of Kikeni last year. So we're talking about Watford, but this is just an old Kikeni team. It's just to make it easy for the, for the puck outs. This is what I was seeing at times. So obviously the Watford lads would mill around in the back as you, have, uh, as you always would and try to find pockets of space and tip and push up on them. But there was basically, it seemed at times, and not always, but that you'd have four players in a sort of a tight formation in the middle of the field. I remember one time in particular, Ozzy Gleeson being man-marked by Dan, um, Dan McCormick. He was on the left wing. And Desi Hutchinson was basically at the corner flag. So I get it. They're trying to create space. So we can see here there's a huge uh, raft of space here and here. And obviously, if, uh, if uh, the goalkeeper, Sean O'Brien, does a, sorry, Billy Nolan in this case, does a 1-2, he could maybe drive it over the top for the defenders to come But what was happening was it was just a lot of 50-50 ball on top of the numbers anyway. So I kind of wondered what was achieved by it. And there was a bit of a theme throughout the game of Desi Hutchinson being over at the corner flag, being in his own half, basically being anywhere except in front of the, the, the posts, sorry, in front of the goals where he can do his damage. Like there was one uh, instance, do you remember when Stephen Bennett ran, ran through in the first half and he kind of got caught in two minds whether he should pass it or take the shot on, take on the defender. And he ended up getting his shot blocked down by, I'm trying to remember who was it. It was... Uh, yeah, I'm not entirely sure who it was. I think it might have been Brian O'Mara blocked him down. But what had happened was Desi Hutchinson, as soon as the, the break had happened from Stephen Bennett, Desi Hutchinson ran for the corner flag, which opened up the space, which is all well and good. But then when Bennett met Brian O'Mara, he had no one to pass it to. So if Desi Hutchinson had to peel away, but on the loop where he could come back and be available as, a, as an option for Bennett, he might have got himself a goal. So I just found it a little bit strange and maybe even Davy Fitz is thinking, you followed it a bit too much to the letter of the law there. Obviously, use that corner flag thing to create space. But, of course, you still have to make yourself available for the ball. Yeah, I, I have to say, I think Watford are overthinking it. Um, and I have to say, with I, I didn't I couldn't notice him the other night, the, the man behind the wire. But I, I all think this is feeding into, and some of the tactics are feeding into, like, actually just overthinking it. And it's there's not enough instinct in the game. Um, and they're not playing with instinct. Well, one player that is playing with instinct definitely is Caelan Lyons, anyway, who was br brilliant again the other night. And just you know, you know, when, when you see him moving, you see him opening up the legs. It's a, it's a wonder, it's a wonderful sight. Now I'd love to see him. Uh, yeah, that's uh, yeah, opening up the legs to run. I should say. Um, I, I can see that been, I can see that been cut out into a separate clip. Um, the only thing is. Uh, does he ever? He always shoots off that right hand side, doesn't he? He never. In it, I'd like to see the teams maybe bringing him back and forcing him to go on that other side. But yeah, when he opens up, he's like he's such a weapon from centre back, isn't he? He's he's one of your biggest attacking weapons from centre back. But to me, I would have said Watford weren't getting enough out of the guys that they actually had in the forward line, and I'd be amazed if Desi Hutchinson isn't back in around the edge of the square again because I just find it mystifying with with what they're doing with him at the moment. Um. But yeah, it was a funny kind of walk for performance at different stages. Different stages, they were good. They were good to start. Really good at the start of the second half. When when Tip, I have to say, were really, really wasteful. Tip went back to the old Tip in the first 10 minutes of the second in the second half when they were just striking ball in long and it was going it was completely aimless. They made Tyke Borka look like an absolute hero. Then all of a sudden, for the last 15 or 20 minutes, the Borka doesn't get on the ball at all because Tip are playing the ball around like they should be playing it around. But... um. From a tip point of view, you'd have to say hugely encouraging. Uh, Jake Morris, who we haven't mentioned so far, showed the eye for goal again. Now, Waterford were very open at the back for those goal chances, like ridiculously open, you'd have to say. But he took the goals really, really well. And uh, I think it's set up for a cracker when they meet again. 
Have you seen a more pointed comment than the one that's just up on screen from N. Cren? What will kill Claire's chances is outlandish. Ooh, okay. Um, that's interesting. Uh, that's pretty. That's pretty. That's pretty cutting, all right. And we we cut, but that's pretty cutting. Yeah, uh, Avery McGrath. He's coming for us again regarding Tipperary. Any concerns about the period after half time when they looked totally out of ideas before James Owens handed the game to them? Blatant free out for the push by Morris and the red. Yeah, there was there was, there was definitely a hint for push there. I, I'd hold. I definitely agree with that point. But throughout the game, as I said, I was beside Tomas McCarthy, uh, the journalist from Watford, and I kept saying. I see only one side has been refereed here. No tip free again. Oh, Watford had allowed 10 steps again. I was actually where, at a stage where he couldn't even argue with me. Uh, maybe <laughs> Tomas will come in with a comment to try and put me straight. But I felt Tipperary weren't getting a whole pile. But, you know, maybe there's a point. Uh, Adrian McGrath has a bit of a point there. But the red card, it seems to, you know, across the board seems to be accepted that it was fair enough. But I, I was disappointed to see a red card because we had a nice game. There was only three points in it. Uh, so it kind of ruined the game, really. It was it? kind of hard to predict what was going to happen at that point, uh, to be honest with you, because Waterford were after get, making their way uh, back into the game and make, after making their way back in really, really well. One thing that Davey's going to have to do is he's going to have to get Stephen Bennett firing from play again because he just hasn't looked like the player of a couple of years ago. Um, I don't know. No score from play in the league. Yeah, I don't know did he score from play in last year's Munster Championship as well. I know Craig Morgan was on him the first day. I don't think he scored. I don't know. I'm not, I, could, I could be wrong. I could be wrong, but I, I don't remember him scoring much from play if he did. And they need to get him humming again. Plus, like you, you might um, go through it a bit more. Like, they have a fair whack of injuries coming into Munster now. Like It's quite close. What are we at now? We're at the 13th of March. We're looking at... Tw- five weeks tw- away? Yeah, five weeks is not much time. And a lot of them are big players as well that Davey's going to be sweating over. Yeah, so like Austin Gleeson, he came off. Hopefully that's just a precaution. Connor Prunty came off. Michael Kiley's injured. Dara Lyons, Connor Gleeson, Sean Walsh, Shane McNulty. I mean, it's a fair list. And even before the game, so a lot of people there were frustrated with the amount of changes to the match programme. There was people changed within the 26. So PJ Fanning, Paddy Levy and Keane Wadding, they all came in. So there was changes in terms of numbers. Then the amount of players that were in different positions than that they were originally... Uh, posted so I do think it it needs to get to a stage now where it's either you put squad numbers in here and that's it or any time any change that's made to a match program basically means you lose the substitution in the game you know because this nonsense can continue like it's a cod for supporters at this stage to be buying a match program if that's going to happen yeah, I've no issue with um, guys that are named playing somewhere else. Maybe that they're not, you know, two playing four or three playing six or six playing three or whatever. But when, when the 26 is changed and lads are like four or five lads are out of 26 and four or five are in and, you know, it's very confusing for spectators as well. If you haven't brought a pen with you, like you don't know who, you're not 100% sure who these, you know, new players are coming in. Um, so as you say, it's uh, yeah. Anytime you say cod, uh, just yeah. Anytime you say cod, I just think of Eamon Dunphy. He's a cod, Bill. But uh, <laughs> yeah, hopefully, hopefully they're gonna have to, something's gonna have to happen. It's getting worse and worse in recent years. Um, Sean O'Sullivan says one positive was the Waterford crowd. We were at least a match in numbers for Tip, if not beating them. Desi reacted to his own players a few times when the ball wasn't been switched to his wig. Uh, Ford looked very sharp even in the warm up. Uh, as I said, you'd pay to watch that warm up. <laughs> Jason Ford was brilliant when he came in. Like they needed, uh, they needed somebody to come in and make a bit of an impact there, just to add a bit of life to it. And he definitely did. Seamus Canlon going off is obviously a worry. Um, yeah, he just didn't look, didn't look happy. Um, I w- like I wouldn't say I wouldn't be fearing the worst, worst, but I'd say that it looked like there was maybe a bit of cartilage damage. I remember having a bit of cartilage damage I mean that was a big problem you're kind of moving it around like that so I'd say it might be something like that but again the proximity to the Munster Championship would be worrying uh, in that regard with Barrett uh, Cadell Niall O'Mara and obviously Jared Brown is out for the year as well and Craig Morgan and Barry Heffernan so you don't like you don't want to be adding to that list you don't want to have five or six out coming into Munster because you can guarantee you're going to have another five or six out by the time you get through Munster just given how attritional it's going to be yeah, Cassius King says, or a fine, or hit them where it hurts. You see, I think making all those changes to the program, it's not going to hurt the manager. The manager is the one you have to hurt to stop them doing it. So that's where you get rid of their substitutions 
and that would annoy them. So I think that they'd stop on that account. Uh, Adrian McGrath again, tips only scores in that period came from a ball, let it up to the forwards and the Waterford man who got to the ball first and miscontrolled it. Um, to be fair to um, to Waterford, there were some things I really liked. I thought Colin Dunford looks like a player re-energised. He scored four points from play. Jack Prendergast did some very good stuff at times. You already mentioned Caleb Lyons, four points from play. And I thought it was clever enough to put him on Noel McGrath because Noel McGrath was good and does a lot of good stuff. But I suppose keeping after a greyhound like him isn't really going to be uh, his game at all. I thought Michael Breen, he's, he, he was in fullback. Uh, well, he was in and out of fullback in different places in the backs. You know I like him in the backs, but I didn't feel it was his game. I thought at times he, he kind of struggled. Uh, Seamus Kennedy was named seven, but just kind of played that withdrawn half-forward role. So Tip had more changes than normally they would have had to the match programme. Uh, I found this interesting. Waterford in the first half, so they had a total of 20 scoring attempts. Their forwards had just three scoring attempts from play. Now, they scored two of them, but I get what you're trying to do, interchanging and all this kind of stuff, but it just seemed like it wasn't quite coherent enough. If your forwards are having just three shots from play in an entire half, that's that has to be a suggestion that you should change things a little. Your, your your forward should be having three shots from play in the first five minutes, let alone across across the whole half. Again, I just think there's there's I'm all about thinking about the game and tinkering things. I just think there's too much thought been put into this and I think they're you know I just think there's too much top put into it and a lot of I think a couple of players in particular don't look particularly comfortable out there. Um so this is gonna be it'll be interesting to see if they can turn it around uh be interesting to see if they can turn it around, but they're going to be missing Barron the next day for the Kilkenny match. I think Davy probably be happy enough not to get to the league semi finals. I think Kilkenny need uh need a draw or better to get through to the league semi league semi finals. Whereas Watford really, with that sort of a casualty list, probably the last thing they need is to be in a semi final, and they need to just go off and do their own thing for a couple of weeks and get ready for the Munster Championship. Yeah, a lot of red cards for Watford so far this year, which uh, you know. That's something they definitely need to address. Davy was talking about the in, uh, injuries after a match. He said hamstring to Pronti, hamstring to Austin. McNulty had to come off at the end. Depends on how bad they are. You're looking from three to six weeks, and Pronti is a big loss. We're going to race against time with the Limerick game, and Mikey Kiley would be touch and go. Dar Lines probably won't be back, but no excuses. Be ready to go in April. By the way, I thought Tyke de Borca, first half bypassed him. Excellent in the second half. Uh, delighted to say we've got Ursula Jacob on the show now. Uh, Ursula, how are things with you? Not too bad. How are you guys? We're not too bad. We've been talking rot and hurling there for the last <laughs> <laughs> 45 minutes, so we're going to keep it going. We'll start off with the Cork-Wexford game uh, with you. So 214 to 18 points. Wexford had a great start. They were all over Cork and kind of faded out of it. What was your take on the game? Yeah, it, it was looking really positive for Wexford in particular in the first half. And, you know, they, they started a lot. Uh, a lot better than Cork and it, as we know it took Cork 20 minutes to score um, probably at that stage I felt Wexford should have probably pushed on even a little bit more you know we were probably a bit unlucky not to get a goal from Lee Moog that time and um, defensively we obviously were a lot tighter and I think Matt O'Hanlon had a big part to play in that because he really steadied the ship uh, in the full back line and obviously then Dio O'Keefe was sitting back in the pocket as well um, because you compare that to two weeks previous against Clare and we had 4-17 gone in uh, in the first half alone so Dar Egan knew going down to Parky Cueve yesterday that we needed to tighten up and we did thankfully that's a positive we can take from yesterday's game that we did uh, tighten up a good bit uh, Lee Chin obviously was massive to have back um, he's, he's the leading player for Wexford one worry is maybe the over reliance on him, um, and trying to keep him fit and away from injuries now. Between now and championship is key for Wexford. Was there, was there any of those younger players that you were impressed by? I have to say, like Charlie McGuckin isn't that young; like he's been around a couple of years, but he really impresses me overall. Connor Hearn did quite well. I thought Rory Higgins had a big impact when he came in. So, what about the players that Dar Egan's trying to establish? Yeah, and I, 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 I know Dara. You know, I've heard him speak a few times throughout the league. And he's really trying to blood new players. Uh, Wexford probably know that last year in that championship uh, loss to Clare, that the impact of the bench for Clare made the difference and Wexford need to have that as well. Um, yeah, as you said, McGuckin, you know, has been playing well in the last couple of games. Rory Higgins, as you said, he got a couple of good points in the first half. And it's trying to blood more and more of these players. Uh, James Lawler, in fairness, in the goal made off, made 
two cracking saves in the game and, and Wexford could have been in bigger trouble at, at certain stages. So I, I 100% agree with Dar Egan. We need to strengthen the panel. We probably don't have the same depth as a, a Limerick have, but we have to try build on it. But even more key to any of this is getting the big name players back. Where, you know, yesterday, worryingly, you know, Connor McDonald went off. You know, Liam Ryan is still not back. Uh, Damian Reck went off. So these guys, we can't afford to be without. Obviously, you know, it's great to see Lee Chin play a full 70 minutes. Um, Rory O'Connor came on. So there is positives. But at the end of the day, we are going to be looking to these players to to kind of make up the most of the, the Wexford team. Yeah, and Matt O'Hanlon went off injured as well. Looked like he might have jarred his knees. That would be another huge loss. Yeah, and as I said, he really steadied the ship in the full back line. And you can't buy that experience. It's it's all well and good wanting to blood new players. but you still need to have those key players in each of the lines. And you could see that Cork have a nice balance between the kind of more youth and experience, but Wexford need to get the, the big guys back, like the Macho Hanlins, Liam Ryans, Connor McDonalds, because they've been there, they've done it, they've played on the big stage. And yeah, you don't mind blooding two or three new players, but you can't go into a, a, a Leinster Championship opener against Galway with nine or ten new guys who haven't who haven't played at this level yet. Yeah, it, it does seem across the board that injuries are a big issue. Like, we uh, named out Waterford's injury list, Tipperary have a huge amount. Of, like, some of them are happening in club championship last year and they're carrying over and all that. So it's not all just heavy training, but Cork have a list as long as you're um, so of Wexford. Any any sort of common team that you can see here? Or, or, like, are we trying to fit in too much in too short a space of time with this calendar? Yeah, I, I think it possibly is uh, down to the condensed calendar because, as you said, you're you're trying to fit so much into a short space of time. The intercounty managers are trying to get in as much training and a heavy you know training load now because they know once the Leinster or Munster Championship comes, it's going to come thick and fast, and you don't get a a chance to breathe, let alone do much else. So, um, yeah, I can only imagine that training at the moment for for all teams is pretty heavy. Um, and then when they're playing matches in conditions where, you know, yesterday down in Parky Cueve, it was quite uh, tough conditions as well. So if you pick up a knock there, it's obviously going to set you back as well. But yeah, I'd agree fully that there does seem to be a trend across the board that we see so many players going down injured. And I suppose it's something we don't want to see in our game because whether I'm a Wexford supporter or whatever, I want to see the best players out on the pitch and you don't want anyone uh, out with, with long-term injuries. Would would it have been any concern for you watching Wexford concede two bo- uh, goals that were basically long balls into the area? I would have thought Matt O'Hanlon would be disappointed that he didn't just nudge Porrick Power out of the way. Lovely finish now. And then the long ball at the end breaks, Cormac Bassang puts it in. Yeah, and it, you know, the two goals were quite similar because as you said, they were two long dropping balls. And you know, I'd have to give credit to James Aller. I think he had a good game overall, but the two goals we conceded, I think I'd be more uh, disappointed from a dis- defensive point of view because, look, Matthew, as I said, had an excellent game yesterday, but he probably he probably should have forced Podrick out over the line. Now, credit to Podrick too. He did get a, a beautiful flick on the ball. Um, the second goal, I felt that maybe Wexford's backs got ball watching and kind of... Cormac Bozang uh, drifted in behind. So I would feel defensively we should have done better on that one. Um, you know, but I suppose two goals is better than conceding six from the previous. So if we can keep bringing that down, um, you know, coming into championship, that'll be a good thing. But just a, a note on goals, like Cork have got 10 goals in those four games in the league. And you can see maybe the impact that Pat Ryan is having on, on this Cork setup. There's that little bit of a ruthless streak. Um, and we know Cork are brilliant hurlers, but they really do seem to be going for the juggler in, in these games. And across the board then, who do you see as the most likely challengers to Limerick this year? Well, at the moment, you'd have to say the in teams are probably, look, Tip, um, Cork, Clare. I know Clare obviously lost against against, Gal- or against Galway yesterday, but for me, I, I think there's a lot in this, in this Clare team. I'd give them huge... You know, I obviously, I wouldn't read too much into the hammer and the Geva Wexford, but I just think the few key players that they have back, like Aidan McCarthy, I just think he's a massive uh, addition to the to the Clare team. I I think Clare, you know, might be the, the closest to Limerick. Um, now, in saying that, Tip and, and Cork are really flying at the moment, but it's whether they can sustain this going into championship. And obviously, if injuries play a, a, a part in anything. But for me at the moment... Um, even though Clare lost yesterday, I think Clare might be the closest still to, to Lim- beating Limerick. 
And is what's the mood like in in Wexford around the team? You know, there are all the injuries and all that. Do do people see a big year coming for Wexford, or are they a little unsure? Well, I suppose you know it's been probably a disappointing enough league because this time last year we were winning every game and we were heading for a league semi final. Whereas now we're we're not we're, we're just going to be focusing on the next kind of six weeks and and the Leinster Championship opener. So yeah, I suppose there's concern and worry that we're down so many players still. And I know you can't make excuses and uh, and that, but you would worry the fitness and uh, will these guys get back in time for championship? And as you said, it's sh- such a short time turnaround to championship as well. Um, but I suppose that's going to be the focus. I think Dara has been urging Wexford supporters to nearly have a little bit of patience with the team because, you know, we, we went all guns blazing last year in the league and we came to a league semi-final and got beaten well by Watford. But um, this year, I suppose he's kind of putting a greater emphasis on getting that strength and depth. And I know as a supporter, you just want to see the wins more so than having the patience. But look, I think we have to trust Dara as well that he's got a plan in place and maybe the focus and emphasis is more on the championship this year than than winning all the league games. But as you said, we've only beaten Westmead so far. We've got the All-Ireland champions now on Sunday, so it's not going to get any easier in the final round. Yeah, last year, I remember, I did. I went on to South East Radio the day before the opener between Limerick and Wexford. Yeah. And I was like, you know, and I watched Wexford being hammered in the Walsh Cup. And I was like, look, lads, I think it's going to be a 10-point last year. And Wexford go out and win and give a very good performance. So, you know, maybe they can turn. As well, I was going to ask you about the whole relationship with, with Kilkenny. For years, Kilkenny were on top. And I'd say there was probably an inferiority complex for a while. Winning in Nolan Park in a championship last year. Is that... That inferiority complex with Kilkenny gone? I think so, yeah. I I definitely do. And that was probably a huge moment in, in Wexford's uh, championship last year. It was a real turning point. And, you know, they were going in probably as underdogs into that game. But I suppose that fear is no longer there. And it's one that Wexford nearly thrive on now when they when they get to play Kilkenny. And no doubt again in, in Wexford Park this year, it's probably going to be a sellout game. Um, and Wexford are going to be looking to get one over Kilkenny again. But look, uh, I have to say, as a Wexford supporter, you you love seeing uh, you know Kilkenny coming to Wexford Park. We we tr- we we try to create uh, you know this kind of atmosphere down in Wexford Park that can be quite intimidating. Um, now Kilkenny are not going to be coming down making up numbers either. But um, I do think we bring out the best in each other as well, and the crack and banter you have with, with, with supporters as well is good. But look, it'll be interesting to see. Derek Ling is obviously new in this year as well. So I think it's going to be a cracking encounter no matter what. And uh, depending on results before the game, um, it, a lot could come, to, could, could, that could come down to that game again this year. Do you reckon Wexford have changed their style of play much since Dar Egan took over from Davy Fitz? Or is it just like an adjustment or might, wildly different? Yeah, I suppose there's similarities and obviously maybe a little bit of differences. I still I still feel that Wexford probably play their best when they're running off the shoulder, running at numbers um, and attacking the, the opposition. I know some people were quite critical that we were maybe driving in these long balls into the full forward line that was coming out just as quick. Um, I think it's finding the balance right uh, with that because as we saw just say in that clear game last year, when Lee Chin and Conor McDonald and those guys were in the full forward line, the long ball worked. Um, but you need someone with a presence like Lee Chin in there if you're going to go long and direct. Um, sometimes maybe we we can be critical that we overplay it when we when we go short as well. So your your hurling level, your skill level, everything has to be up at top level if you're going to do the short passing game. You know, Cork are excellent at it, but when it does break down, the opposition can just counter-attack immediately. So it's getting that fine balance. I don't think we've massively changed away from the way we were with Davy Fitz, but um, I suppose Dara is trying to put his own stamp on it. And he's the second year in the job as well, so he should be that little bit more familiar with, with, work, with what works for these Wexford guys. Yeah, I would have said that something that bothered me a bit about Wexford last year and this year again is the amount of time, and this is tipperary, a Tipperary problem as well, the amount of times lads are shooting from 100 yards because it's very 50-50. And obviously, those lads are playing in the backs because they're not the best shooters on the team. <laughs> is, is yeah, that some... I'd agree. And in yeah. particular, you know, we saw, it, um, we saw it against Galway in the first yeah. round in, in the Walsh Cup final. I was in Wexler Park that evening and it was beyond frustrating because you have guys in the inside line. You know, I know I was an inside player and I'd absolutely be going mad if 
these guys who are playing, you know, in the half back line, the full back line, shooting from 60, 70 yards when that's not the right decision to make. And I suppose it comes down to decision making, knowing when it's right to shoot. Now, I know last year, Damien Reck got five or six points in championship. Simon Donahue chipped in with another two yesterday. But you, you do need to be aware that the guys in the inside line are probably the more natural shooters. So, um, you know, yeah, it's all well and good when those balls go over, but nothing looks worse if you're shooting three, four, five shots from 60, 70 metres out and they go wide. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was going to ask you, who who would be your favourite players to watch in the game at the moment? Um, I suppose, for me, it's probably two guys. Um, uh, TJ Reid is probably, for me, just the most joyous to watch. I think he's he has it all. He's got the skill. He's got the hurling brain. He's got the longevity. He's got the consistency. He's such a selfless player. Um, he brings all the team in around him. You know, he's such a ball winner, a leader. I could speak about TJ all day. I just think he's got every little bit of skill uh, in the game. And I just have mass- massive admiration that he's still going. He's still you know, is wanting to win more. You know, he probably, the easy option for him it could be to step away. He's won it all with Ballyhale and Kilkenny, but he still is looking for more. And I read an interview there recently where he, he even said, like, we can always improve. He's looking to get another percent out of himself. So I love that attitude. Um, and I just think he's a fantastic player. The other guy that I, I absolutely love watching uh, to play, and I'm thrilled to see that he's back from injury, Peter Casey. I think he's probably underrated at times. Um, you know, some of these other guys like Galan and Keen Lynch and Grode Hegarty probably get the limelight a little bit more at times, but I think he's so pivotal to Limerick. I think his footwork, his skill level, he scores probably four or five points each game and he's just lethal. I think he's fantastic and I think he's going to have a big year for Limerick. So those two guys probably uh, stick out the most for me. When you were talking there about, uh, you know, uh defenders hitting shots over your head and you were talking in the past tense about you playing what's your involvement in the sport at the moment outside of punditry uh well <laughs> there's not a whole lot of involvement uh with any team or anything at the moment because i suppose i'm just focusing on uh, the punditry and i had a little girl five months ago so motherhood is taking over a lot of stuff at the moment so look down the line i definitely have an interest in getting involved with a team and management but um, in terms of me going back playing, I'm fully happy being a retired girl at this stage. So, um, look, I had a great career with club and county. So, um, you know, I'm very happy and satisfied with, with what I've done. So it'll just be me watching on from the sidelines uh, going forward. But no doubt down the line, I'll be involved in, in some capacity in management. So um, watch this space, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the little girl, what, what's her name? And uh how quickly was she getting little baby grows with Owlert or Wexford stuff on it? <laughs> uh, well, I suppose uh, she's five months, as I said. Breedine is her name. So um, she's she's got her first hurl and everything from Santa. So um, she's 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 not get, taken to a huge amount of interest in, in the hurling ball yet, but we'll give her time. She's only she's still only young, but she has her Wexford. Uh, Wexford and Owler jersey and she even has a half and half Wexford and Westmead jersey so her dad's a Westmead man so um, we, we had to keep everyone happy so for the Wexford Westmead game now in Wexford Park I'm sure she'll be she'll be in there secretly shouting on Wexford but uh, keeping her daddy happy at the same time and they drew last year in the championship didn't they yeah yeah right. so um, it could it could be a, another close game we'll see but um, I might bring the Wexford jersey uh, with me as well that day, just in case, so we can throw it on her afterwards. So, lovely, um, lovely. look, at, it's great. It's fantastic. And if she plays the game, she plays. If, if not, um, that's OK, too. Yeah, yeah. And you could end up being one of those parents who's kind of panicking at every moment on the sideline throughout, you know, like the stress of watching on. Well, I hope I'm not. I, I hope I'll remain calm, uh, cool, calm and collected. But um, yeah, it'll, it'll be a different scenario if I'm watching her play. But we've a, we've a bit to go yet. She, as I said, she's only five months old, so we'll, <laughs> we'll give her time. But she's getting in training already. Yeah, one downside, it sounds like she wasn't born. A, you know, you wanted a January baby really there, so you're after missing a trick. <laughs> Yeah, I was I was trying to push out, but unfortunately, uh, she she uh, came back in October. So look, we'll have to 
we'll have to deal with that. So maybe in a, in a couple of years, some people are already saying she's going to be talking out soon. But as I said, uh, I'll, I'll, I don't mind what she does as long as she's happy and healthy. So that's the main thing. Yeah, of course. Um, so we love putting people on the spot and asking who's going to come out of Munster and who's going to come out of Leinster. So Leinster, I think with due respect, we know probably a couple of the teams that are going to not come through. But who, who do you think will be the three teams that do progress there? Um, I still, if I'm if I'm saying it now, I probably will say uh, Kilkenny, Galway and Wexford. Um, you know, I know that was the case last year as well. Um, I just feel like I, I wasn't, you know, I was looking at the Kilkenny uh, Dublin game yesterday and I think Michal, you know, I, I think Michal's a great manager. Um, I just, I don't know, do Dublin have enough top class players? Um, I don't know if they have got the strength and depth that's, required at this level and I know they're down a number of players as well but I still think they're a little bit off um I think if Wexford can get some of these key men back and uh away from injury I think we we should have a good Leinster championship campaign um but Galway and Kilkenny um to me still look like uh that they'll that they'll probably uh get through as well so look Kilkenny Kilkenny Galway and Wexford for me in Leinster yeah, like you mentioned that Dublin game, 225 to 117. I think Dub or Kilkenny didn't even have a wide in the first half. And this Yeah, really they were so that. economical in particular in the first half. Um and everything they seemed to touch went over the bar, but like they weren't overly even put under pressure with, with shooting. You know, they had so much space and time on the ball and Give, if you give the likes of Billy Drennan or Owen Cody or any of these guys um time and space they'll put the ball over all day long. And I was just very disappointed with Dublin. They do seem to have a bit of a, a an issue in playing Kilkenny. They really yeah. seem to struggle. Um, and that's a massive psychological thing for them going into Leinster Championship. Are they able to even come close to beating Kilkenny because they've been getting hammerings in the last couple of years? Yeah, it does feel to me like this season is not going to go well for Dublin. Like the ball is coming down the field too easy as well. Like they've yeah. good back and they're getting torn apart. Uh, Porter Porter says, hope to see you on the Sunday game this year, Ursula. Uh, the rules on the show are, when speaking about favourite players, you must mention a tip player. Just bear in mind the next day. Keep Shane on side. <laughs> and then uh, Adrian McGrath says, Ursula Jacob, Aulert, uh, the Bala under six manager, 2027, 2028. Is the name in the hat already, I'm wondering? I'm telling you, I'll I'll, uh, I'll be campaigning already to get that job. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, don't do like what my father did, which was take over the minors and make me captain on the mother's instruction, no doubt. <laughs> yeah, I'll keep her away from the captaincy just at the moment anyway. Yeah, good thing. And then with the, the Munster, who do you think the three teams that would come out are? Like, this is very difficult to pick. Yeah, and... Oh, God, I think you could go around and say three different teams. I think the one team that most of us will probably say is Limerick. Um, and I'll be shocked. And I think we'll all be shocked if they weren't uh, one of the three teams. Uh, as I said at the start, um, I think Clare, um, for me, I think they obviously would be hugely disappointed how they exited the championship last year. Uh, but I think it, if they can kind of keep going uh, with... I think they're probably their panel and their their strength uh, has improved since last year. I think they'll learn a lot from last year as well. Um, so I'm tipping Claire is the second team. Um, third team, I suppose. God, it really now. could be any of the the other three. Um, like at the moment, you're looking at Tip and Cork are, are playing a lot better. But for me, I think possibly Watford. Um, yeah. So Shane, you're not going to be happy with me again. Um, David Fitz will be thrilled that I'm saying this. Um, I don't know. I think Watford, I know they're obviously down a few players as well. I think maybe they're holding back a little bit in the league. Um, and maybe since the fact that last year, you know, I, I know it's different management that they went all guns blaze and winning the league and there was such focus and attention. I think they're going to be going into the Munster Championship a little bit more under the radar than maybe at the moment everyone's talking and and. Dan Cork are doing great. Liam Cattle has tipped back and all of this. So, look, I think there's very, very little between the teams, but I'm going to say it now. I'll say Watford. So, there's my right. three teams. So, Limerick, you're really uh, never going to get, get me back on the, the show now that I didn't even mention tip. No, we're an afterthought. Richard Hogan <laughs> has a good one here. He's asking that. Uh, so, we talked about this earlier. There's a push to get rid of the score. So, your thoughts on the score and do you think it should go? Well, I'm being honest. I actually never had an issue in in the whole scorts i know some girls absolutely 
hate the skirts. Uh, and the funny thing is, when any of us ever train, we always wear shorts. Like you'd never go to training in your skirt. So the only times you ever wear the, the skirt is a game. Um, I'm very 50-50 on this. I've no real problem in the skirt. Um, but I know some girls really just find that shorts are that bit more practical. They're comfortable. Um, and if that if that makes a difference to some people, well, then I don't see any problem in, in changing it. Um, we see ladies footballers wearing shorts. So maybe maybe we should adopt it that uh, the camogie players wear shorts as well and have everything completely in line with the hurling rules. You know, hurlers wear shorts. So maybe camogie players should wear um uh, shorts as well because maybe we should be just starting calling female um female hurlers like because to be honest I'm a hurler like you know I know we, we say camogie players and whatever but I'm a hurler as much as you know someone else so maybe shorts is the way to go but as I said I never really had a problem so I never you know found an issue really with it but if the majority feel that they want to wear shorts then why not and is it because of how they look or how they feel? Is that why some people would have an issue with them? They feel I like think more away. from hearing like discussions over the last while, it seems to be comfort wise. Um, right. Now, shorts, I, you see, I suppose, as I said, we all wear shorts in training sessions. So, and even practice matches, you'd find that most girls would end up wearing the club colours in a shorts. Um, right. I think we just get more drawn to wearing a shorts. They're probably maybe slightly bit more comfortable, but as I said, I never personally had an issue with a with a skirt. Um, so like I, I I'm not really the the right person to talk to because I I would just get on with it. I'd no issue with wearing a, a skirt, but I I would imagine it's more down to the comfort. Um, oh. that shorts are that bit more comfortable. Okay, well look, Ursa, it's been absolutely brilliant having you on the show, and we definitely will be looking to get you on again. So appreciate that. No bother, and I'll tip. Uh, I'll tip tip the next time. <laughs> yeah, would appreciate that, or even yeah. just name name check one or two players has been really class, and that'll do. Me. Okay, <laughs> no bother. All right. Thanks very much, Ursula. So brilliant to have Ursula Jacob on the show. There, really good stuff altogether. Um, just some of the other fixtures we haven't touched on yet. Antrim they beat Leash, and Leash were doing well for long stages here. Um, but Antrim with a 318 to 118 victory, they've assured their Division 1 status for next year because it was a bit of a de facto semi final. So that's Antrim out of the equation in terms of finishing bottom on the table. Uh, just some of the scorers Conal Cunning, Kobe Cunning, he scored 110. Uh, a goal came from play. Neil McMahon, it's a great catch and turn for his goal. He got 1 1. Nigel Elliott. He got a goal. Uh, Keelan Malloy, a couple of points. Nine McKenna, the same. For Leash, Picky Maher, he got seven points, six for freeze. One four for Aaron Dunphy, including a very good goal where he was soloing through and sort of put it down to Hurley, flicked it up and batted it past the go uh, goalkeeper. So I thought that was very good. So that's a really disappointing one for Leash. And that puts him uh, basically on course with Westmead for a relegation uh, final, which will be happening down the line, assuming that results go to form in the meantime. Uh, just some of the other results as well that we haven't touched on at the moment. By the way, you might have noticed that Michael Verney, he stole out the gap when uh, when Ursula Jacob joined us. So that he has to uh, go and do something or other. So I didn't really quiz him, but he has something to do. So we let him off with that one. Kildare, they beat Kerry 220 to 21 points. James Burke, he scored 12 points. 10 of those uh, were frees. Gary Keegan, he scored 1-2. Brian Byrne got a goal as well. Uh, down beat Derry, Piers Oak, McCrickard's uh, injury time free not only earned down a share of the spoils, but it also kept the side in Division 2A for at least another week. Uh, Offaly, they beat Carlo 119 to 12 points. Owen Cal, as he so often does, and as Verney, his Burr teammate, so often reminds us, he was a sharpshooter here. He scored 11 points, eight of those frees. Uh, Keelan Kiley, he scored four points. And David Nally, he scored a goal. And Nally, of course, scored that sideline winner a year beforehand. Westmead uh, showing respect to the greatest team of all time. Nice touch. That's Jared Cosgrove talking about the uh, guard of honour that Westmead gave Limerick. Uh, Offaly will meet Kildare next weekend with a, a place in the final up for grabs. The second and third place teams, they face off in the semi-final. So that's Division 2A. In Division 2B, uh, Mead would, made it four wins from four in uh, in 2B, as I said. Uh, that's Saoirse Bulfin, who's over the team there. 
and they uh, they beat Wicklow, or sorry, the, sorry, they beat uh, Tyrone with Wicklow, their next best on four points in that group. So two B results: London five sixteen, London two twenty, sorry, Sligo two twenty, uh, Tyrone eight points, West Me or two seventeen, and Wicklow two twenty four, Donegal eleven. Then Division three A, Roscommon, they uh, had a two twenty to six point win over Armagh. So things have changed an awful lot since Francis Holler left a couple of months ago. Question the. Uh, Commitment, I suppose, of the players. Huge win there. Louth, they beat Fermanagh by a point, 19 points to 115. Mayo, 525. Monaghan, uh, 13 points. So that's a serious victory there. Huge scoreline being put up. Uh, the next uh, results are in 3B. Longford, 18 points. Lancashire, 10. And Cavan, 21 points. Leitrim, 211. So my uh, my old cooler teammate, Nicky Kenny, he made his um his debut for Cavan recently he's, he's living up there and he's hurling with them this year the former Kilkenny minor making his debut recently aged 37 for um for Cavan so I do enjoy that and we do be ribbing him about it all the time uh Richard Hogan says Kildare hurlers on a roll David Herty working the oracle story of the league so far a uh, good touch, uh, but we'll hold on at least equal four in a row before calling him the greatest team of all time. So that's it from the show today. A reminder that we're brought to you by orgaretro.com. Uh, there's a uh, 15% off if you lose the promo code our game. A reminder, we are doing the live club fundraisers. We've got the first one coming up with Rowan Moore very soon. A couple of more clubs are on to us in the meantime as well about getting those done. So email us at events at our game.ie. That's it from the show today. We'll see you again on Thursday. By the way, we did have a great coaching clinic over the weekend with Pat Ryan, Michael Fenley, and also with Brick Walsh. So we'll be putting videos up on patreon.com forward slash our game very very soon so thanks very much for joining us really do appreciate it as ever 